our today's speaker is Matt Weiss, and he will talk about uh, land rights and a centralized mass database. Thank you, Sabine. Uh, you know, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Um, this has uh, been a really exciting project to work on. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Mars Land Registry. Um, we'll just go ahead and jump right into it here. Uh, there's going to be a whole lot of information, so pardon me if I if I speak a little too fast. Uh, but uh, I will be hanging out in the alt space uh, in the in the hub section of the alt space later. If anybody has questions, and then of course I'll be uh, watching the chat after this talk. So this this is an application. It's it's an app. It's going to be web based as well as uh, cell phone based, and uh, it's a decentralized application for. Uh, both finding information as well as contributing research, as well as land claims on Mars. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means as we go. So we're going to give just a brief kind of, uh, kind of preview of what the app's going to look like. And then we're going to get into the development team, uh, why all of this matters, like why we're bothering to even do this in the first place. Um, blockchain, which is the technology that we're actually building this system on top of. Uh, citizen science and land registry, land rights, government ownership space lawyers, and then we'll come back and we'll do a little more in-depth preview of the app. So here is your, uh, your, first, uh, your first taste of the app. This is a screenshot. Um, if you were to pull out your cell phone and pull up the app, uh, you'll be able to zoom in down to the, um, the surface level of Mars. And we're working to provide as much detail as possible. And we're reaching out to really every, every geological database or geographical database with regard to Mars that we can get our hands on. Uh, you'll see that you can click on any given square here. It'll bring up the um, uh, region information, your lat long, and over in the in this little dialog box that pops up, uh, you can look over and you'll see there's um, uh, some little icons. Uh, so if there's any imagery or if any rovers have uh, 360 degree imagery, uh, as uh, we continue to as uh, James Burke continues to develop Mars VR. Uh, you'll eventually be able to click on the Mars VR icon there, put on your, your virtual reality goggles, and walk around the surface of Mars. It's the next best thing to actually catching a starship and going exploring in, in person. Uh, and then also this other larger icon with the, um, with the uh, magnifying glass on the page is uh, it's going to allow you to contribute certain uh, citizen science research, uh, geological um, analysis, um, all sorts of different things. You'll be able to contribute to the body of knowledge for Mars. And this is one of our ways that we're hoping to crowdsource and really bolster the, just the human knowledge and understanding of Mars. The second uh, side to that coin really is making this thing so user-friendly so that people who aren't necessarily like us, you know, completely enamored with the space world, or maybe people who have no, um, no grasp of the science um, behind all of this, they'll be able to look at this and, and understand it and easily grasp the uh, information about Mars. Here's our development team. Uh, you've already met the first guy. Uh, I run a research and development company called Clockworks. Uh, Leonard Lopen is um, uh, also working with us. He is the uh, founder of MarsCoin, which is a uh, blockchain and a cryptocurrency. And he founded this Long before really anybody knew what cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, or blockchain were, uh, he founded MarsCoin back in 2013. And uh, while I'm not a financial advisor and uh, I can't give any financial advice, if you're not holding MarsCoin right now, and if you haven't gone and gotten some of that, my gosh, go get some right now. Because it is the preferred cryptocurrency of the, uh, of the Mars Society, as well as you know explorers of Mars everywhere. So I highly recommend... Uh, go check that out. And I think it's uh, Mars coin is uh, like three or four cents a coin right now. So it's a fantastic bargain, but go check that out. Um, obviously I'm not a financial advisor, legal expert or marriage counselor. So this, uh, this whole, um, this whole presentation is purely for uh, information purposes only. All right. So the why <laughs> we're going to discuss the why. Um, the first, I think the first way to start is to look through the lens of Moore's law. Um, now, a few decades ago, uh, he observed, Moore observed that the, the number of transistors in a circuit would double about every two years while the cost was coming down proportionally. But what we also found was, uh, and here's a good uh, uh, chart of how that's, um, 
how that's worked over the decades. We found that we can also apply Moore's law to virtually every angle of technology. Now, whether that was um, uh, whether that was the um, improvement of you know vehicles or computers or processors, really anything you can think of, and also it very much applies to the space industry. As you can see in this next one, um, the cost of payload to orbit has. Um, getting ahead of myself here. So the cost, uh, the cost to orbit for a payload has dramatically decreased over the years, while the uh, number of satellites, number of, of payloads we've been delivered to orbit has dramatically increased. So you can see that as you look through um, Moore's law and you apply that to you know, virtually anything we're talking about, the point is it's coming very, very fast. And if you apply this to space, uh, I think you'll find that uh, we're going to blink and we'll be standing on Mars. A fantastic example of that, uh, I have a great aunt who published a memoir called From Covered Wagons to Space Shuttles. And within her short lifetime, as a little girl, she had crossed the American West in a covered wagon. And then uh, toward the end of her life, she got to see a space shuttle launch. And so if you imagine how quickly technology has changed just in that time, and the fact that it's continually speeding up, uh, very, very soon we're going to have humans living on Mars, and we're not going to remember what it was like when humans didn't live there. Uh, the next why is what I spoke about earlier, where uh, it's public uh, access to information about Mars. And as fast as this is coming, when we start sending unmanned and then manned craft, the public interest is going to peak and having a, uh, an easy access, a, a frictionless access for public to access information about Mars, um, as well as some of the brilliant scientists and engineers who are able to contribute uh, citizen science to the body of knowledge, uh, I think it's going to be very, very important. Um, another example of why is uh, we're going to take some examples from history. Now, Mark Twain said that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Now, this is a satellite imagery of the Earth um, around uh, the mid-1400s. As you can see, the Earth has changed quite a bit since then. Uh, here's a little bit clearer image. Uh, in, all seriousness, in all seriousness, uh, these were images that, uh, or these were maps, actually, that Christopher Columbus uh, had looked at when he was planning his expedition, um, ideally to China and the East Indies by sailing west from Europe. Of course, we all know how that worked out. <clears throat> um, interesting fact about that is that even on his deathbed, Christopher Columbus still didn't believe that uh, he had found a way to a previous to previously unknown continents. He still believed that he had connected Europe with China and the East Indies. Um, his uh, he sailed from 1492, or he sailed expeditions from 14, 1492 to 1504, and then in uh, let's see, in uh, 1497. We have the first uh, first permanent established, um, I guess, uh, living situation with Europeans in Newfoundland. Uh, so, approximately a hundred years, and uh, we have permanently established. So we had uh, the ill fated Roanoke colony, and then we also had Jamestown in 1607. So, if you consider how quickly we had these permanently established from a previously unknown continent. Um, I think this is a good lens to look at the, uh, the human crossing to Mars. The last great, uh, I think, uh, movement of humans to previously un unknown lands was the Europeans coming to the New World, and I believe that Mars is going to be very, very similar. And so having a, um, a system like the one we're proposing, both for um, centralizing knowledge and, and, and data about the planet, but also for deconflicting uh, land claims. And then as you see, when we go in here, the overlapping possibilities of this technology are really, really exciting. And when we look at, you know, following those, um, those colonies, up until the end of the 1700s, we had a great deal of conflict. Uh, here's a, a fun image of Jamestown as it, uh, as it was in 1607. And then, uh, you can see that uh, the future may not look quite so different. And obviously this is just an illustration, but it's an exciting idea. <clears throat>
So with Jamestown, initially, what's interesting about this is initially very few people went there for industry. Uh, the majority of people that went there, um, now obviously um, a lot of the people wanted to create their own destiny, but nobody was looking to own their own land or to have their own potato farm. Um, whereas when people first came to the new world, they had to band together into one tiny settlement just to survive. And Mars will not be so different, but we saw very, very quickly with Jamestown. And I think we'll also see with Mars that once survival was not such a big issue, people began to branch out and they wanted to, you know, build their own, build their own domes, build their own potato farms, you know, build, have their own space and build their own destiny. And I think that's something, uh, exploration and, uh, you know, ju just to uh, fail and succeed by one's own efforts is something that's hardwired into humans. Now, certainly it won't be entirely for industry or explorers. I believe science will lead us to Mars, but I think exploration will get us there. And uh, we can talk more about that a little bit later. Here's a, just a quick um, rundown of some of the major conflicts that happened. And all of these conflicts were for control of land. Some of these for, in fact, 40 years, there was a company that controlled the majority of North America, and they conducted a 40-year armed conflict against their competitors. Um, so just to give you an idea, this isn't just nation states. This is also um, corporate interests, uh, which were causing a lot of uh, conflict. And I believe with a proper system, we can avoid that. Again, ideologies that conflicted um, in the past century. Uh, it's, it's arguable that there was any ideology that conflicted more than the Americans versus the Soviets. Um, and yet it gave us the space race and all the things we accomplished through that. Uh, Time Magazine recently did a reboot of their 1968 cover. It kind of shows you, I think, where we're at with um, all these different ideologies, all these different political ideals, and all these different agendas and interests, uh, which are heading out to the moon and Mars, and why it's so important to have a system that we can all agree on that doesn't require us to trust each other, um, essentially to deconflict and create a, a civilized space as we go out and explore these, um, these celestial bodies. Here are some more ideologies that probably don't, uh, don't quite line up. And then, of course, everybody's going to space now. So um, the, the number of nations on Earth who have either partnered up or who have already made stated that their mission is to go to Mars or to develop the moon uh, is expanding. So now we'll talk about blockchain. And this is the, um, the technology that we're building this on top of. And I won't go all the way into this, but just to say that um, the reason or the benefits of, of blockchain, the reasons that we're doing this is because one is decentralized. You know, if your server goes down, you lose all your files, that's terrible. But with a decentralized uh, blockchain, you might not even notice if one of those nodes goes down and it's much more secure. You have transparency. You have trustless uh, system, which means that um, nobody, even if you and I have completely different agendas or we have uh, different political ideals, uh, we don't have to trust each other because the system we're both using is an impartial third party. And it is a completely impartial system. And it's also ownerless, which means that there's not one person who's, uh, who can be corrupted, who's running the whole show behind the curtain. And then we're partnering with MarsCoin. Uh, the Mars coin blockchain, uh, for a number of different reasons, the tech, um, the technology behind Mars coin is a very, very solid project, uh, but also the vision behind it absolutely aligns with everything that um, those of us in the Mars community are trying to accomplish. Um, this graphic gives you an idea of some of the, uh, some of the overlap, and just these are just a small number of the potentials with the technology. Whereas you would have the Mars land registry with you know, land claims and information resources. This can overlap with currency and smart contracts, uh, cargo manifests and tracking, resource management for oxygen and water ice and what have you, mineral rights, uh, voting. Um, James Burke, I believe, I don't know if, I'm not sure if he already talked about this or if he's still yet to talk about this, but um, in an MDRS mission, we'll be testing these voting systems on a smaller scale. 
And this is very, very exciting. This is real technology that's being um, fielded right now. And then we'll talk about uh, the citizen science and the, uh, the land registry. Um, and we've already touched on that quite a bit. The, um, there was, a, I forget who it was, there was a, um, one of the officials from NASA that was uh, quoted as saying that there are a lot of astronomers and scientists, um, just citizen scientists who are more well-trained and more well-equipped even than the majority of NASA and, and the official funded uh, space program. And when you consider that there's that many resources and that much interest and passion out there for, for all these things, then you can start to see where um, there's a wealth of knowledge that can be contributed. A fantastic example, uh, if, if you haven't checked out Zooniverse yet, uh, go and look that up. It was a crowdsourced um, method for, uh, for um, cataloging galaxies. And the, and the thousands of photos that we were getting back was just too much for the limited number of scientists on staff to, to catalog. So we'll move forward here. Um, we're going to talk about land rights real quick. Um, this guy, now this is an interesting story. Dennis Hope, uh, this guy claimed the moon. Uh, not only did he claim the moon, but in, in uh, so in, since 1980, he has been selling acreage on the moon and he's uh, sold more than 2 million acres. And um, in 2004, he, um, let's see, in, uh, in 2004, he um, founded the Galactic Government, uh, which is a democratic republic that represents extraterrestrial landowners, has a ratified constitution, a congress, unit of currency, even its own patent office. And um, the documents were ratified and accepted by the United States and signed by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Now, if this sounds crazy, um, consider it through the lens of maritime law and precedence. Uh, now, regardless of what the current laws and legal system is, you know, if we start having uh, people travel to the moon regularly and they say, hey, I have a claim on this particular acreage, is that a precedent? Could there be a legal basis for that? It's a fascinating thought, but um, I think if there's a if there's a centralized, agreeable database where we can provide precedent and and ratification for those land claims, I believe it deconflicts a lot of or it it removes the potential for conflict that can arise between two people trying to claim the same piece of land or trying to push each other off of a particular piece of land. A couple of guys also uh, claimed an asteroid. This particular asteroid, um, a number of years ago, uh, NASA just happened to uh, bump a probe, the OSIRIS-REx probe bumped into their asteroid and uh, collected a sample. Well, they said that they had legally claimed the asteroid before NASA arrived there. And so they sent NASA an invoice for parking fees. Uh, to my knowledge, NASA has yet to pay the parking ticket. Uh, quickly, we'll go through uh, government and, and space lawyers. So the the two main um, the two main texts that I think most legal experts will point to is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, uh, which, by the way, was before humans had ever landed on a, another celestial body. So may may require some level of updating. And um, these are photos of the uh, the signing and ratification of that. Now the, the preamble um, is, uh, is a very noble um, meaning. So, so the believing that the exploration and use of outer space should be carried out for the benefit of all people, respective of their degree of economic or scientific development, all humans, not just the elite humans, not just the wealthy humans, not just the good humans, all humans. And this has been somewhat, um, I think, misinterpreted by many space lawyers to say, well, all of space belongs to all humans, all at the same time simultaneously, which, as we know, just is not um, is not realistic. And the rest of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, so the rest of these articles, we won't go through each one of them, but they essentially discuss that um, countries are responsible for their um, for their activities in outer space. 
but it doesn't um, preclude individuals from uh, from claiming and owning land, only sovereign bodies, uh, which could be interpreted to mean companies as well. But um, that's going to be uh, that's going to be an interesting uh, debate when it comes to it. Uh, how would you stop somebody? Uh, for instance, the Artemis Accords. Um, only 12 nations on Earth have signed the Artis Artemis Accords. Uh, meanwhile, China and Russia have uh, created a partnership to develop the moon. Now, if they just develop a part of the moon that you know somebody else didn't want them to, who's going to stop them? You know, there is really no police. There's no um, effective uh, organization to police that. And so, again, if we come back to a system that you know, the, the Chinese, the, the Russians, the Emiratis, the, the Japanese, the Americans, nobody has to be able to trust each other when we have a system like this, which we can, which we can all know is an impartial system by which we can deconflict de each other's activities uh, in space and on Mars. And so here we'll show a little bit of the, um, um, a little closer look at the app, as I promised. So you bring up the app, and it'll allow you to take a look at a globe of Mars. We'll be able to zoom in closer and, and look at all the different areas. And then, of course, you'll be able to zoom right down to the, uh, to the fine detail, and you'll be able to click on the different squares, and ideally about one kilometer size squares. Uh, some other icons I forgot to mention earlier that I'd like that we intend to include are Wikipedia, Marspedia, etc. So, for instance, when you see the um, uh, in the upper center of the presentation where the Viking One landed on July twentieth, nineteen seventy six, well, in this uh, in this dialog box down below, you'll be able to click on the Wikipedia icon, and that will take you to the external link that talks about the Viking program and the uh, the lander that arrived there in 1976. Um, also likewise with Marspedia. Now, obviously claiming land on Mars is a complete novelty at this point. Um, unlike Dennis Hope and selling acreage on the moon, uh, no one is selling anything here. This is simply a free way. Uh, this is a completely costless. We're not charging anything for this app, um, but you'll be able to claim land on Mars, and your claim will uh, expire if you don't go to Mars and confirm that claim. So keep that in mind. Um, what's fun about this, though, is, you know, in the beginning, it is a complete novelty. Uh, there is really no reason, since humans aren't currently doing anything on Mars, there's really no reason to claim land or own it or, or there's nothing you can do with it. However, one day there will. And the hope is that eventually this thing, which is just a novelty at the moment, will eventually turn into something much more serious. And whether this system is used or whether this system is just seen as a pattern for a much better system that's created when humans do finally arrive on Mars and start to um, start to build and start to create that first human city on Mars, ideally, uh, this will provide steps in that direction. Uh, however, on the on the novelty side, the purpose between the purpose by purchasing land on, or purchasing, excuse me, claiming land on Mars is to create public buy in. Imagine if you're a person out there in the general public who has never really been a space nerd. You never really thought about it. But you see that Elon Musk has just sent a starship and it landed on Mars. And we've got lots and lots of video of the landing and looking around Mars, et cetera. And you want to know more about Mars. Well, you find out there's a way you can claim land. And if you can make this claim and that incites more curiosity and more interest and in that our goal is to just drag you down the rabbit hole of all the fascinating things there is to know about Mars and the missions surrounding it. If we can do that and if we can pull in the general public, that is, that is our purpose behind building this application. It creates the buy-in with a, with a land registry. You can get ahead of everyone else and you can claim your land. And uh, if you intend to go there in the next, I don't know, next few years, next decade or two, 
build your potato farm where you already have your plot picked out and uh, you can decide what has the best geology and what has the best access to water ice. All right, and I know I'm running a little bit out of time. Yeah, thank you for this very interesting lecture. Um, there are many questions in the chat. Uh, what's the name of this app? Uh, this app is the Mars Registry. Okay. And uh, the claims include uh, subsurface -sur rights, uh, for example, lava tubes and tunnels, which have been turned into habitats and other uses. Exactly. It would be just like uh, real estate. You know, if you were to think about a real estate ownership in, you know, on Earth, uh, typically you own the land and whatever's below it, unless there's been a prior agreement by somebody else who's owning the mineral rights underneath. Um, the next question is, uh, is there anything of value baking mass coin? Uh, can you repeat the question? A uh, moment. Uh, is there anything of value baking uh, mass coin? So Mars coin, is a crypto, Mars coin is a cryptocurrency and like, like most cryptocurrencies, um, it is the community behind it that, that creates the value. But uh, for instance, if, if you had 100 Mars coin right now in your pocket, there are exchanges on the internet, you can go and you can exchange that for whatever your local currency is. So it does have a, a very real value, yes. Uh, what fraction of the total mass coins have been minted so far? When I look it up, uh, it started in uh, 2014, and it seems mm -hmm. like 60, 70 percent have been min mined. I don't know the exact answer to that because mining is ongoing. Um, I don't know if James is still in here. He yeah, I, I am, Matt. <laughs> it, that's correct. I don't know if it's exactly 60 percent, but that, that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, there's about 3.6 million mined, and I believe there's four point something total. Yeah, which is actually a very, very good thing. If you understand the economics of currency, by having a limited amount like that, um, it, uh, it guards against inflation. And so really the value will only increase as the supply runs out. Oh, yeah. Um... How is it more ethical to claim all the land beforehand rather than the land rights going to those people that actually bear the expense and uh, risk of traveling to Mars and improving the land? That's a fantastic question, actually. So uh, one of the things that we've built into the land claims is that your claim is only a, a prelim preliminary claim. But one of the stipulations is you have to go to Mars to confirm your claim. And the minute you land on Mars, your claim is ratified. And, you know, essentially, according to our system, which is backed by no, no legal government in the world yet, um, that um, your, your claim would be, uh, would be solid at that point. If you don't go to Mars, and, and there will be a certain amount of time allotted where your claim will, will be good, your claim will expire. And you can always renew the claim. In fact, uh, we're working out a way to reward you by contributing research and citizen science by which, you know, let's say, for instance, uh, and this hasn't been fully determined yet, but let's say you contribute three pieces of research to the database. Well, then that will earn you the, um, the ability to renew your claim for another, you know, six months, one year, et cetera, something, something like that. Um, in which case you would have that much time left to go and travel to Mars to, uh, to ratify your claim. I hope that answered the question. Uh, I guess you had uh, assumed that, that there's a own government on Mars uh, who can decide uh, who will get the land and uh, because I think uh, an international agreement we will not get uh, here on earth uh, as you mentioned uh, that China and Russia is against mm -hmm. uh, the United States and not everyone is uh, signing the contract so um, my question is uh, do you think that we will have a, a, a mass government uh, 
who will decide uh, you can buy the land or not? Actually, that's another fantastic question. If we look through history, um, every time a, a group of people have gone to settle a new place, eventually they have established their own government. Eventually they have established independence. And I think it's, it, it's probably a foregone conclusion that will happen on Mars. Uh, I think it's unreasonable for, a, for an Earth government to try to govern Mars just because of the distance. Uh, at that point, I don't believe it's a, it, it's not the government that bestows the rights of the people to own land. The government exists to ensure the rights of the people to own their land uh, freely. And I, I believe that Mars will belong to its citizens. Mars will belong to the Martians. Mars will not belong to, you know, um, China or India or America or Russia or any, any other Earth-based organization. I believe Mars will be very independent. And I don't believe that any of these governments will establish the land claims. Um, the only thing that these governments can do really is to be informed of the land claims or to uh, admit, okay, yes, we recognize that you claimed land, but it would be like um, if somebody had claimed land in, uh, like a, if a Russian citizen had claimed some land somewhere in Russia. Nobody cares if, uh, if Mexico recognizes the legitimacy of their land claim because Mexico has nothing to do with Russia. And so it, I think it'd be very, very similar on Mars. Mm. Um, do you think war will always determine uh, who owns what? Uh, it's a sad thing and I hope uh, this doesn't happen. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Uh, do you think war will always determine uh, who owns what? As all as written here, uh, it's a sad thing and uh, this Mason who wrote it uh, hopes uh, this doesn't happen. Maybe it, it's not a question. And uh, then another question from Peter is, uh, is there an area of land limit or can you buy as much as you want to? Uh, obviously, there will have to be a limit. Otherwise, some I think somebody would just go in there and just spend a whole day claiming everything. Uh, there will certainly be a limit. Um, oh, yeah. At some point, and, and this is just my personal opinion, I, I foresee a time if, uh, you know, once this is really caught on where we do have a legitimate system for claims where people are living on Mars and claiming the land, um, I believe that eventually land claims will become uh, sort of like an NFT. If uh, it's, it's a newer technology uh, a lot of people are not familiar with, but it's essentially a digital ownership and you'll be able to sell that digital ownership between people. And so it'll actually go beyond the land claim system and other people will be able to, you know, let's say you have an exciting piece of land on the caldera of, of Olympus Mons and I really want to, you know, build a summer home there. Well, I'm gonna, I may purchase your claim and then I'm going to go to Mars and ratify my claim. Uh, and there's another question. Is your app available in the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store? And uh, what is uh, your website? Maybe you can put it in the chat. Absolutely. Um, so I, I actually really like that question too. Uh, give me one second here and I will... So this is the way to, to follow us and to contact us at this point. You can uh, email me or you can follow at, at Marge Registry on social media. Um, unfortunately, we had hoped to have at least a basic version of the app available um, for the Mars Society convention this year. Unfortunately, uh, we came to a point in the development where we thought, you know what, this can be, this can be better. And so we really kind of... Um, we kind of rewrote everything that we were building at the time. And it's, if, if you saw that last little image of, of the globe moving around that, uh, that I put up there, that is uh, sort of the, the next level version of the app that we've been, that we are currently building. And it's so much better than the original version that we had come up with. We're very, very excited. Unfortunately, we have had to delay it a little bit. So uh, we don't have an exact date for release yet, but follow us on social media and, you will certainly hear about it as we get closer. Okay, um, I will go back to my question. Maybe you didn't understand my dialect. Uh, it was claimed here. Do you think war 
will always determine Krieg. Also Krieg will uh, always determine who owns what. It's a sad thing and I hope this doesn't happen. I'm just thinking about a good answer for that. Historically there has, and um, I wish I had more time to really go into the history. I've, I, have a, I have a much longer presentation which goes, it delves really deep into the history on that exact question. And this was a, that question was in fact a huge um, motivation for developing this app because historically, you know, like for instance, in the Americas, when the Europeans first came and everybody else was coming and there was, there was just war for several hundred years and it was, it was really unnecessary, but there was no pre-existing system by which anybody could agree. And of course, if, if, if the British, for instance, had created a system, well, the French and the Spanish would have rejected it because nobody trusted each other. And I think if, if we can create something like this, uh, like this uh, app that I'm proposing, then at some point that will create a more civilized way for humans to go and explore and, and eventually colonize Mars. So my hope is that the system we're creating here, you know, both the Mars registry as well as the entire ecosystem that I talked about with, you know, the Mars Coin Foundation, I believe that those things can very easily allow us all to inhabit Mars in a very peaceful and civilized way. And I think that it is possible to move into an era where war over land and resources is is unnecessary because at the end of the day, the cost of, of those resources really never justifies, uh, or the cost of war really never justifies the, the resources of the land that you receive for it. Thank you, Matt, so much. And um, I hope uh, we can invite you uh, again uh, for a lecture and, um, yeah, um, I will write you an email <laughs> and uh, thank you for this uh, interesting lecture and uh, thank you for the, uh, to the audience for listening and I wish you all a nice evening. Thank you very much, Sabine.